Greetings to each and every one of you. And I'm praying that the Lord would touch each of you with what he has to speak to your hearts and lead you into the year 2018 with abundant blessings. A special welcome to His Excellency Dr. S.C. Jamir, the Governor of Odisha, Mrs. Jamir and the rest of the family and the staff members, Mr. Bajayant Panda, the Member of Parliament, Mr. Priyadarshini Mishra, the Member of the Legislative Assembly, and Mr. Anant Narayan Jena, the Mayor of the City of Bhuvaneshwar. We want to assure you that this church prays for you regularly as you serve the nation of India. We pray for your safety. We pray for God's wisdom to rest upon you. And even as the country is observing Good Governance Day, we pray that God would give you the wisdom to govern this country well. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer as we seek his wisdom and his word for this morning? Father, we thank you for yet another Christmas that has come into our lives. And as we open the word of God, the Bible, and look to what you have to share with us, we pray that you would speak to us, Lord Father God, and give us the strength to live by those words and give us the hope to hold on to those promises that you give us this morning so that our lives are better than what they were yesterday and would get better each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. The season of Christmas can be extremely stressful. And tell that to somebody who is a housewife. She will tell you all about it. What it is to make those eateries, those cookings, those gifts and the shopping and getting the children ready for church on, on the Christmas morning. In one of the shopping malls, a lady was walking with shopping bags in each of her fingers. And she was also having a couple of kids with her and she was running to catch the elevator. And as she ran to catch the elevator, she got into the elevator and the doors of the elevator were closing and one of those gifts got stuck in the door and it cracked. And this woman got so wild and she screamed at the top of her voice, whoever is responsible for this whole Christmas thing, he ought to be arrested, strung up and shot dead. And somewhere at the back of the elevator, a man very quietly said, don't worry about that. They already crucified him 2,000 years back. <laughs> Who is responsible for Christmas? The Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 16, in the words of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's God who is responsible for Christmas because on Christmas Day, he sent down his son as a gift. He gave his son. Something that is given is not something which is sold. Something which is given is actually a gift and it is free. And God had given that gift called Jesus as the Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 16. And why did he do that? That gift had a purpose. If you walk with me to the next verse, verse 17 in the same book it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus did not come to stand up there and tell people that you are a sinner and you need to be condemned. He did not stand up there and say that I am holy and you are unworthy. He just came there to say that I have come here to love you, not to condemn you. But I have come here for a relationship with you that you might be saved. The world looks for moksha. The world looks for salvation. The world looks for questions as to why am I here? Why have I have been created? Why is this world here? But Jesus stands up there saying that I got an answer for you. Let's have that relationship. And I have been sent by God. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a walk of life. It's a belief system and it's a relationship. Let me repeat. It's not a religion. 
It's a walk of life, it's a belief system, and it's a relationship. It's a relationship with the one who made the whole universe. There's something so unique about the birth of Christ. The noted author C.S. Lewis, who's famous for the book series called The Chronicles of Narnia, which was made into a movie series which went on to be a, Bollywood, a Hollywood blockbuster film, a series of films. In the last book, it says, The Last Battle, and this is what he says, Once in our world, a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. Let me repeat that for you. Once in our world, was a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. As you look at the universe today, as you look at the number of stars out there, number of galaxies out there, they are innumerable, they are countless. But there is somebody who made it all. And as you walk into your body and you start looking at your own DNA, as you start looking at the ball and socket joints in your bones, and you would be amazed as to which mechanical engineer would have made it. As you look at how the lens in your eye is placed and precisely positioned where it needs to be, you would wonder as to who is this marvelous architect. And that architect of the whole universe chose to come down 2,000 years back and lay there in that stable. And C.S. Lewis was very right in saying that that stable was holding much more than the whole world itself. It was holding the creator God. 2,000 years back, the Magi, the wise men as we call them, and as we see in the nativity scenes, they say there are three wise men, but the Bible doesn't say that there were three wise men. There could have been more. These men were searching for Jesus in Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 to 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. They were searching and they were asking this question, Where is he? And these were astronomers, these were magicians, these were people, some historians say one of them could have been from India as well. One of them could have been from Babylon. And these men studied the scriptures, studied prophecies, studied their own religious texts. And they found that in their own religious texts, there was a prophecy of somebody who would be a savior. And they went searching for him because astronomically they found that there was a new star that was out there in the universe that night. But the question that they had was, where is he? That little infant Jesus that night could not speak. He could possibly cry but they came searching with that question where is he but as that infant grew the purpose of that infant was not just to be there as an infant Jesus but to grow on to accomplish the purpose for which he has been sent to earth that question where is he went on to be a question that many of us ask today who is he who is Jesus as you walk with me to John chapter 6, when Jesus was grown up as a man, interacting with the universe, interacting with the scholars, interacting with the philosophers, interacting with the masses, he makes this statement in verses 41 and 42. The Jews then complained about him because he said, and he said something strange, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? Whose father and mother we know. How is it then he says, I have come down from heaven. Imagine a man making that statement in the mass, in the front of masses saying that I am the bread who came down from heaven. The people would look at him and say, what is this lunatic talking about? He's talking about coming down from heaven? Wasn't this guy born a few years back, 30 years back? Haven't he, we seen him? being born in that little town called Bethlehem, but he is making this statement saying that I have come down from heaven. The context of that statement was also, if you look at chapter 6, the context where Jesus does a miracle where he feeds 5,000 people. And as those 5,000 people came, his heart was moved with compassion and he asked his servants, what are we going to give them to eat? 
and they had nothing to give them except a little bit of food that was there and he multiplies the food and he gives them something to eat and each of them had their belly full and then he makes the statement i am the bread of life you might be looking for this food that can fulfill your physical hunger but there's something that you need that needs to get into deep into your spirit so that your spiritual hunger can be fulfilled and you can have life even after death the question of life after death bothers everyone living on planet earth what would happen to me after i die what would happen to my family after i die that's one worry but they would also worry what would happen to me after i die but that's where jesus says i am the bread of life and when those people were interacting with him he says you're looking for gifts from me you're looking for that food that i gave you that healing that i did but let me tell you i am the gift myself and when you have me you have life eternal because i am the bread of life in another instance in mark chapter 2 verses 5 to 7 when jesus was sitting in a house and he was teaching a bunch of people that house was crowded there was a man who was paralyzed who was brought there and people wanted this man to be healed there was no way that they could enter through the main door of that house what they did was they ripped open the roof and they dropped this man down and he was lying on a stretcher and when jesus looked at this man he makes this profound statement in verse 5 son your sins are forgiven you the man came there as a sick man as a paralytic man lying on that stretcher and jesus makes a statement saying your sins are forgiven people could not for a long time get the connection between these two situations a statement that he made and a situation that the man was in but then the teachers of the law and the teachers of the scriptures of that day called the scribes the statement in verse 7 and speak blasphemies like this who can forgive sins but god alone philosophies and religious walks of life from which our part of the world have tried to deal with the sin problem whether it is a sacrifice of an animal or whether it is washing in a river or whether it is going on a pilgrimage or whether it is paying for their penances they try to deal with it in many ways and here comes a man who stands up there and he says your sins are forgiven and that was something that these men could not stand could not digest and says who is he who says that the sins are forgiven only god has that authority in the midst of all of that jesus makes the profound statement from john chapter 6 verse 38 and i want to focus on that for the rest of the message this morning and this is from the passage that was read to us a while ago this morning Jesus says in verse 38 for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me if there was a description of that gift that was sent down 2000 years back if there was a user manual of what the punch line needs to be on that particular gift this is the punch line this is a gift that has come down from heaven to do the will of the one who sent this gift and the gift was speaking jesus was speaking i have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me i want to dissect this into two parts here let's look at the first part of the statement i have come down from heaven this proves that jesus was not created but he existed before his birth he did not say that he was made He did not say that he was created but he says I have come down from heaven. This is a very bold statement dear friends. Jesus presented his uniqueness by making that statement. At the outset I think it's important for us to understand the nature of the birth of Jesus. Jesus was God incarnate. Jesus was born to a virgin. Both of those were very unique in themselves. 
God came down and he did not come down in the form of the, an, an avatar of a, of, of a creature which was very different from man. But he came in the avatar of man himself. Incarnation of God in the form of man. But that man had to be unique. That man had to be blameless. That man had to be sin free. And hence he was born of a virgin. And if you were to do a DNA test on that man, that DNA would not match any human father. That blood would be so pure because that DNA would match with the heavenly father. A sinless, blameless, blemishless man. The only purpose for which he was created was to be sacrificed. When people go to sacrifice an animal in a religious place, they look for the best of the lamb or the best of the hen and take it there for being sacrificed and here he is the most purest form of God's creation the son of God and he came down from heaven a miraculous birth in John chapter 1 verse 1 it shows that indeed Jesus was there even before he was born it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. If you have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to open the Bible when you go back home. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and see what was happening right at the beginning in terms of how God created the whole world. God did not create the whole world by putting his hands to do something, but he spoke. He spoke. He commanded and the creation came into being. And that word that he spoke was Jesus himself. And that Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 1. As you move on to verse 14 it says. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. And the glory of the only begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. Let me give you an example. We try to teach our children how to behave. We try to teach our children the code of conduct. And sometimes our children are not with us. We speak to them on the phone and we try to give them instructions. But imagine you had the power and the ability to give a demonstration of every instruction that you gave. And act it out in front of them. And they have a live example. And here is Jesus. Everything that was spoken and written. He was living it as the word of God in flesh. And the people of that day could touch him. Could feel him. Could sit with him. Interact with him. And understand the walk of life. Understand what it is for a righteous living. Understand how it is to think straight. Understand how it is to govern well in their own situations. The Roman rulers of those days came secretly and met Jesus to understand how it is to run their empire. Their little, little uh, positions that they were given. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, the prophet said, as it was told to us a little while ago, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. For unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given. It doesn't say a son is created. It says a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Look at those. They are not just titles, but they are qualities. He brings peace, is the Prince of Peace. The Everlasting Father, it means he gives life forever. The Mighty God, it means he's got answers to prayers. The Counselor, he's got wisdom. The Wonderful Counselor. It says the government will be upon his shoulders. He's not talking about the earthly government, but he's talking about the government in the hearts of men, where they have the principles of how to live written and Put there as a stamp. Living by those principles can make any person a different person. That's the first component. I have come down from heaven that Jesus made in John chapter 6 verse 38. And then comes the second component of the statement. Not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. This begs the question. What is the will of him who sent him? 
the what is the will of the of of god the father who sent him and i want to put that in three pieces this afternoon for us this morning for us the first one is that the son of man jesus has been sent down to earth to be a shepherd to many the first s that i want to present to you is jesus the shepherd if you look at luke chapter 19 verse 10 jesus makes this statement and i'm going to present to you statements here where jesus says the son of man has come for this the son of man has come for this now the son of god has now become the son of man because he is living in human form in luke chapter 19 verse 10 it says for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost to seek and to save that which was lost let us understand the context in which this statement was made this statement was made in the house of zacchaeus zacchaeus was a short wicked man by profession he was a chief tax collector and the tax collectors of those days were extremely corrupt they were known for usury they were known for bribes they were used for ex- known for extortions they were known to be working for the romans who were fleecing the jews but zacchaeus had a very funny identity the word zacchaeus means pure imagine being a very corrupt guy but having a name which says mr pure but jesus looks at zacchaeus when zacchaeus wanted to catch a glimpse of jesus as he was passing in front of his house zacchaeus was standing on a tree shamelessly trying to look at him jesus looks up to him and says zacchaeus i want to come to your house today and spend time with you when somebody who's impure in heart is called as mr pure something happens deep inside his heart was broken his heart was changed he goes and sells his wealth and he gives away half of the wealth to the poor and he says i'm going to return to people multiple fold than what i have taken them through wrong means now that's transformation that's good governance that's an amazing change in terms of what has happened in the life of that person and that's when jesus makes the statement when people looked at him and said how could you go to the house of this man Don't you know that he's a sinner? Don't you know that he's a corrupt man? You're a holy person. How could you go to this person's house? And Jesus makes this statement: The Son of Man has come to search and to save that which is lost. Friends, if you are sitting here in this church or in the overflow area, and if you're struggling deep inside with this question, does God really love me? how can i be accepted by god for everything that i have done for everything that i think let me tell you if zacchaeus could experience that love from god you have been shortlisted next you have always been on the list of jesus it's just for you to open your heart and let him in because his love is so amazing and he wants to shepherd over people you know a good shepherd is one who actually takes the lambs and feeds the lambs In John chapter 10 verses 10 to 11 there's a contrast that is given between the devil and Jesus. In verse 10 of John chapter 10 it says the thief which is the devil does not come to come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. A friend of mine when I was living in Bangalore his house was ransacked and robbed by 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 thieves. and he was in the united states at the time and we went to see his house the house was completely shattered they had no pattern in where in which they have robbed the house everything that was in the cupboards were just ransacked thrown on the floor we didn't even know which was lying where that's how thieves are they come to steal they come to kill they come to destroy but in the same verse jesus says but i have come to give life and to give it more abundantly in verse 11 it says i am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep when a wolf comes to attack the sheep the good shepherd is willing to die for the sheep and fight for the sheep and that's jesus for you that's jesus for you jesus loves you so much that he wants to be with you that he wants to protect you that he wants to shepherd you that's jesus in his own words 
that gift that came down 2000 years back in his own words he says the son of man has come down to be a shepherd to search for the lost and to save them i'm going to take you quickly to the next component here where jesus says that the son of man has come to save people and forgive them from their sins i present to you the second s this morning jesus the savior turn with me to mark chapter 2 verse 10 it says but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins the son of man has got power on earth to forgive sins you would have possibly seen in movies or you would have possibly seen people doing it or heard of people doing it going in front of a confession box standing in front of a priest behind a veil and confessing their sins well, let me tell you that priest does not have the authority to forgive the sins it's only god who's got the authority to say it's okay i don't keep a record of what you have done and that's what jesus had to say that's what the gift had to say when jesus said the son of man has the power on earth to forgive sins luke chapter 9 verse 56 for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them and they went on to another village he has not come here to condemn but he has come here to save that's jesus the savior in galatians chapter 4 verses 4 to 5 it says but when the fullness of time had come god sent forth his son that is jesus born on christmas day born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons let me tell you you go back to the old testament read the book of deuteronomy read the book of leviticus and you would find law after law law after law rule after rule you might have understood about the 10 commandments there are many more beyond the 10 commandments but even even if one of those is broken you are a law breaker and we have the law makers of our country sitting here and they would let us know that in the indian penal code even if you break one law you are a criminal you need to be exonerated or you need to be punished either of these two the same in the kingdom of god also jesus was born under the law but he fulfilled the law he was the only human being ever to have fulfilled the law he had the same struggles as what every other human being had he was born of a virgin not to a human father when he interacted with other children the other children would have looked at him and said hey your father is god is it you're kidding me man tell us who your father is he would have been rejected in his society when he was born they were hunting from place to place for a place where they could rest in a small little guest house they were poor he grew up in poverty he grew up in rejection he grew up in a society which did not value him he was tempted like anyone else but still he lived a life which was holy and he also has got the authority to exonerate people from their sins jesus the savior and the only reason that he could do that is because of what is written in the book of hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil every sin every crime has got a punishment to pay for either money or physical effort that needs to be done or if it's even worse it's a death penalty but here is jesus who gave his life in death for the sins of all mankind let me tell you you and i have been created so that we can live but jesus was given on earth and he was born as a human being so that he could die the only reason why he came down was to die 
and to die with a purpose to die with a purpose so that he can bear the sins of all of us so that we don't need to make any more sacrifices john chapter 8 verse 34 says again in the words of jesus most assuredly i say to you whoever commits sin is a slave to sin nobody needs to teach somebody how to sin you look at a small baby who is about two years old I was once in a house where there was a two-year-old little boy and his five-year-old brother, elder brother. And both of them were playing and the two-year-old scribbles on the wall with a pencil. And when the mother is asking from the kitchen, who is scribbling on the wall, the immediate response of the two-year-old boy was to point the finger at his older brother. Who taught him how to blame? Because sinful nature has been ingrained in man because originally our forefathers chose to sin and rebel against God in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. We recently heard about a crime that was committed in Delhi which the police have no clue how to deal with. A four-year-old boy sexually assaulting his classmate with a sharpened pencil and with his finger. Would this pass through the juvenile court? And this guy is just ceased to be a toddler. He's four years. Whoever taught him whatever he did. And as people grow, they do stuff like what we read recently about a woman in Hyderabad who fell in love with a strange man and both of them killed her husband. And later on, the man burns his face to do plastic surgery to look like her husband. And both of them I mean, were, were, were accomplices in that whole crime. He was admitted in the hospital and this whole thing was uncovered. We live in a world where crime has no pattern. New things emerge because people are enslaved to sin. And that's what Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 34. And this was corroborated by, the, uh, by a study in 2010 by Northwestern University. That the human brain is hardwired to sin. And they found sins like lust, gluttony, slothfulness, envy, pride, wrath and greed ingrained in the human brain. And that's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus for our Lord. For everything that we did, for everything that we think, the, everything that we are capable of doing, we need to be sentenced to death in hell. But through Jesus, we have redemption for our sins. And that is what I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. The second quality of that gift, that is Jesus, the Savior. He had to die and then live to defeat death. He did not die and stay there in the tomb. He came out alive after three days because death was defeated. Right at the beginning of his ministry, the Lord Jesus preached just one thing in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He looked at a transformation of the heart, not an outward transformation of the garb. He doesn't care what you wear, how do you look, but he looks at what your heart is like. The last thing I want to present to you in the words of the gift as to what the gift is all about and who he says who he is, the gift is the servant king. I presented to you the shepherd, the savior, and now I present to you Jesus, the servant king. Again, in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he says, the son of man, notice the words, he doesn't say the son of God. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He is so unlike many of the godmen that we see, many of the philosophers that we see in any part of the world today, where you have a retinue of people following them to serve them. But here is Jesus who says, I've not come here to be served, but I've come here to serve. Even before his death, he went to wash the feet of his disciples. The many instances that we see in the Bible where Jesus actually fed his disciples. He called them to the beach and cooked fish for them. He fed people, 5,000 people fed through a miracle. Jesus the servant king. I want to tell you something very drastic here this morning. 
if you are trying to serve Jesus, don't do that. He doesn't need that. He doesn't need that. What he needs is obedience. Many times we try to put a pat on our own shoulder and a feather in our cap saying that I am serving the Lord. Hey, hang on. He, you, he doesn't need to be served. He doesn't need your offerings. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need those coconuts and candles. He's not running a coconut oil factory in heaven. All that he wants is obedience. All that he wants is for you and I to reflect his glory on earth and his nature on earth. Let's not try to be God to God. I got truth truths for you this morning. Number one, there is a God. Number two, that you are not that God. There is a God up there in heaven who wants us to live like him. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 10. It says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even to the death on the cross. He came down with a purpose. He gave it up. What are you willing to give it up this morning? If there is a pride that is holding you back from going and mingling with people and letting them experience the love of God, shed it away. What is stopping between you and God in terms of a relationship? Knock it off. Don't consider it robbery. Your pride means nothing. He doesn't need your service. He doesn't need your sacrifice. All that he needs is your obedience. I think we need to move ourselves from the question of where is he to who is he. And as I presented to you this morning, the shepherd, the savior and the servant king, would you consider this morning to have a relationship with that savior? Would you consider this morning to subject yourself to the care of that shepherd? Would you consider this morning to reflect the nature of that servant king? So that not just you, but even others around us during this Christmas season can experience the love of Christ. The world out there is hurting. The world out there is so hopeless. You know, hopelessness is something like taking a fish out of the water and putting it there in a hot sun. But in the middle of all of that, God can intervene in their lives. And he can only intervene when we go in contact with them and share the love of God. John Rice said this, you can never truly enjoy Christmas until you can look up into the Father's face and tell him that you have received his Christmas gift. Christmas is not about Santa Claus. Christmas is not about a Christmas tree. Christmas is not about carols. But Christmas is about the gift that came down. The shepherd, the savior and the servant king. Christmas is about that relationship. Would you bow down your head with me this morning? If you have never spoken to Jesus in your life, the man who 2,000 years back came to Bethlehem and lived on earth but died and was laid in the tomb came alive. History could not disprove the fact that Jesus came out alive. You go to Israel today, they were not going to show you a tomb which is a sealed tomb calling it as the tomb of Jesus. It's an empty tomb. Jesus is alive. And I want you to say a silent prayer to Jesus. And tell him that you want him to be your shepherd. You want him to be your, his, your savior. You want him to be your servant king. Speak to him. It's your time with him. Union Church. I'd like you to take this message to all those around you who are hurting in the world today who are victimized, who are brutalized, who have no hope, who could be sick, who could be lonely, tell them that there's a God who loves them. Father, we thank you for this amazing gift called Jesus. 
We thank you, Lord Jesus, because you have come to do the will of the Father, which is to find the lost, to find the lonely, to find the hopeless, to find the hurting, to be their friend, not just to be their friend, but also to deal with their sinful nature, the sins that they have committed, and Lord, to forgive them, to forgive us, to forgive me, so that Lord, we can have a relationship with you, unclean as we are, but you have chosen to call us pure. Each and every one of us who are seated here, you have chosen to call us as saints, as it is written in your Bible. We thank you for that wonderful relationship that we can have with the heavenly Father and our brother Jesus. We thank you for this. And this time we want to surrender as a church to serve the King by obedience, not by sacrifice, but by living a life which has the mind of Christ, a mind of compassion, a mind of gentleness, a mind which focuses on things which are holy and pure. We thank you, Lord. Bless everyone who is gathered here. And let the coming year be a year where they experience your power and your glory and your miracles in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.